And welcome to another edition of Perspectives Live. My name is Andrew Beattie, and I'm going to be your co-host for this afternoon. And we are so delighted that so many of you could come on and join us today. Today's show is really exciting because we're talking about something that's very, very important, especially as we're hitting a second wave of COVID-19. And we're going to be dealing with specifically the mental health and well-being. But we're looking at it from a from a context of a from a post-secondary educational context. I think it's and what I mean by that. We're going to be looking at things like, um, you know, how it impacts students and how it impacts uh, how it impacts faculty and staff and support teams that are out there. So we're really excited to have this conversation. We're really delighted that you could join us. You know, before I get too far into this, I really want to make sure that you everybody understands that. Um, that we couldn't do this without the possibility of the corporate support of our partners. And I would like to just take a second here and acknowledge TD, Field Effect, Avis Budget, and BGIS. If it wasn't for their corporate support for CICAN, we would not be able to deliver not only Perspectives Live, but so many other of the great initiatives that we do. So thank you so much to, uh, to our corporate partners. Now, I also want to move on a little bit and talk a little bit about the show because I'm going to be joined in a little bit by some great by my co-host, Dr. Janet Morrison, who is the president and vice chancellor of Sheridan College. Now, many of you might know Janet already, and I am so delighted that Janet will be my co-host today. But on the show, she will be having her guests as well. And on that, we are going to be having Chris Adam, um, who is the I'm just going to I want to make sure I get the the title correct here we go coordinator of the sustainability and living campus initiative at Dawson College we have as well uh, Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Benoit Antoine Bacon who's the president and vice chancellor of Carleton University and I am so delighted that we have Nikki Fraser who's not only a student but she's an indigenous advocate and she is also the founder of Uniting Our Voices so we are really excited to have all of, all of these guests, and they'll be joining us in a little bit. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about what makes Perspectives Live a little different than other shows out there. Now, Perspectives Live, what we do is that th what makes this show different than other all the other webinars and everything else you've attended is we give you the ability to be able to participate and engage directly in the show. And we do that through by giving you the means to be able to ask questions of our guests a little later on. So you're helping shape the direction of the show. So almost the last half of the show will be directed to your questions and answers. Now in Slido, what we can do is uh, using our technology Slido, we use, uh, you can actually put your questions in there and then you can actually, um, you can give it a thumbs up, Facebook thumbs up like, um, and then those questions that, the, that with the most likes get elevated to the top of the queue. So what I want to do right now is I want to try and have you guys activate a poll. Um, and I'm going to put the poll up right now. And let me just see if we can activate it. And let's try this polling question. So everybody in Slido should be able to, act, to see this right now. And it says, based on a recent survey, what percentage of young Canadians indicated that their mental health has been negatively impacted by COVID-19? Now, I see... That, that people are starting to, uh, to answer those questions right now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back to that in a little bit. But first, I wanna get started with a, a few introductory no, uh, comments and have uh, and be joined by uh, none other than Denise Amio, uh, the president of CI Ken. Now, let me just see if we can bring Denise up on the screen. Um, hold on a second. We'll see if we can get her to come on live. And there's Denise. Denise, how are you? I'm fine. Hello, Andrew. It's nice to see you again today. It's, it's nice to see you too, Denise. Denise, you know, there was we're talking about mental health and well-being. And earlier today, just this morning, I love what we can when we can uh, have breaking news here. The Quebec government announced that it was yeah. they were going to put twenty five million dollars yeah. aside to support young people in mental health and programs. That that's so must be so exciting. Absolutely. I was very pleased uh, to uh, read that this morning. Well, I, and I'm so happy that that, you, that that we're having this conversation now. Did you want to say a few words and talk about this a little bit? Absolutely. So, alors bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. So, uh, many thanks to all of you for taking 
the time to participate in today's Perspectives live episode in English, where we will be discussing the critical topic of mental health and well-being. People are being challenged like never before in, uh, due to this isolation, physical health concerns, substance use concerns, financial uncertainty, employment uncertainty, and also the emotional dialogue around equality. So we all know that mental health and well-being is a necessary precondition to learning and working. And that physical, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual, cultural, and finally environmental health are interdependent. We know that. So providing effective support for mental health challenges is one of the most pressing issues facing post-secondary institutions today. So post-secondary institutions need to be able to identify and respond to the challenges and needs of students who grapple with isolation, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, physical disabilities, social, racial, and gender inequalities, and financial and many other uh, challenges that I'm not uh, identifying right now. So with students and the, at the art of our mission as colleges and institutes, it means that we must ensure that colleges and institutes have in place a mental health lens to create the awareness, the conditions, and the actions required to address the spectrum of student mental health needs. So with the added stressors of COVID-19, colleges and institutes are more than ever committed to providing faculty, staff, and students with the tools and the training needed to reduce barriers and support success to all students. So as a national uh, membership organization, we are committed to helping our members to overcome the stigma around mental health. And since 2018, uh, Colleges and Institutes Canada has been working with the Mental Health Commissions of Canada, the Canadian Standards Association, Universities Canada and a consortium of funders on the development of a new voluntary national standard to address post-secondary student wellness and mental health. The objective of the initiatives was to build on existing innovative and effective practices at post-secondary institutions to develop a unified national framework intended to contribute to students' success by promoting the psychological health and safety of learners. As many of you are aware, the National Standard of Canada for Mental Health and Wellbeing for post-secondary students was released uh, by the Commission earlier this month, and I sent a note to all presidents to that effect. And it is also on our website. We are confident that the standard will be a positive addition to the wide range of tools and resources that institutions rely on to support their strong commitment to student mental health. The Commission has also produced a starter toolkit, starter toolkit that we invite you to consult. It is a one-stop resource developed to help you align your efforts with the standard. We also invite you to visit the excellent website that the Government of Canada has uh, launched. It's called Wellness Together Canada, and it's in direct response to the unprecedented rise in mental distress due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So finally, I take this opportunity to invite you to consult CICAN website to discover some 
of the resilient and creative ways our colleges and institutes are using to step up to support their students and their communities. Let me finish with this nice quote. We're all going through this together and we believe that mental health and well-being is a journey, not a destination. Each day we can take a step for our own well-being. So we must continue to share best practices and work with all players supporting mental health, whether at the provincial, territorial, and federal government's level, and with public health authorities. Aboriginal stakeholders, as well as community, public, and private organizations and businesses. Together, together we can make a difference in the lives of our students, our employees, our communities in which we work and live, and the collective well-being of Canadians. On that note, let's now hear the perspectives of our three great speakers today. So over to you, Andrew. Denise, thank you so much. I, I love the way you frame that and put that out there for everybody who's watching as well. And you know what we're gonna do, Denise? We're gonna actually add those resources under the resource link um, on Slido so that people can access it and we'll access it. We'll put those show, uh, the resource links on the show notes as well, because I think that's really, really important. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to moving on to, uh, I'll bring you back at, how about this? I'll bring you back at the end of the conversation and I'll get your perspective on what we hear or what we, what we listen to today. How does that sound? Fabulous. <laughs> that's wonderful. Denise, thank you so much again, and we'll see you in a little bit. Now, moving on to the next segment of the show, I talked to you at the very beginning. I mentioned that we had a, I had a co-host today, and now I'm, I'm so delighted to bring on uh, Dr. Janet Morrison. Do Janet, are you there, the president and, and vice chancellor of, uh, of Sheridan College? Janet, are you there? Thank you hey. so much. Hi. How Hi, are you doing? How are you doing today? Uh, I am well. I'm looking forward to the conversation ahead, so thank you. Oh, I'm looking forward to it as well. And uh, and I'm going to in, in just a minute, I'm going to sort of get out of the way, out of your way and let you take over. Uh, but, you know, I started off the conversation, uh, the show earlier on today, and I, and I asked a polling question. I did, and, and I don't know if we saw it, but it was a, it was based on a recent survey. What percentage of young Canadians indicated that their mental health has been negatively impacted by COVID-19? I, you know what I'd like to do? If it's all right by you, do you, I'd like to show those results of the survey and then sort of reveal what the, what the answers were, okay? Yeah. Here's the results right now. They should be coming up on screen for everybody to see. And we look at that, we see 54% had indicated 70%, but yet a whopping 42% of our respondents today, this morning, or this afternoon, have said 63%. You know, Janet, that is actually... Um, that is actually, uh, it's the number is 70% and, uh, and it, it is the correct answer based on that survey. Are you surprised by it being that high? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here today talking about this particular issue. It feels like we talk about uh, this a lot. I think my colleagues will agree. Um, uh, but it's top of mind. And I think leaders, uh, educators, students across the country would acknowledge that this is, a, this is what keeps people up at night. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think this is a great forum. I'm mindful that everybody has their own personal strategies or philosophies, Andrew, for promoting wellness. Mine is grounded uh, in work done by my amazing colleagues, Leah and Rebecca at Sheridan on Campus Mental Health. But it's also grounded uh, for me personally uh, in kind of um, a philosophy called Five Ways to Wellbeing, which promotes connecting with other people, being mm -hmm. physically active, taking mm -hmm. notice, and being aware of your surroundings, learning new things, and giving back. And I think, you know, in that spirit, across those um, opportunities for wellness, uh, learning new things, giving back, we're connecting today. Uh, this is a, a thrilled forum. So if I can beg your indulgence, I'd really like to introduce our three guests and, and ask them some questions to get us started. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. So, so colleagues, um, uh, this is a really impressive panel. So uh, we know that we have colleagues all across the country with expertise in this space. 
Um, uh, but today, again, an impressive panel uh, to provide insight. We have a student leader and an Indigenous advocate. Nikki's also a proud mom, an educator, and an innovator who's used her voice and platform to promote equity, inclusion, uh, and she is uh, an advocate uh, in all senses of the word for Indigenous women and girls. Our colleague Chris is an educator, a social entrepreneur, and a thought leader in sustainability and curating happiness. So I can't wait to hear his contributions. And finally, um, Benoit Antoine is the executive head of a large university who's used his personal lived experience to courageously promote positive mental health and well being. So I'm so honored uh, to be able to sit in a virtual space with them uh, and ask them questions about holistic wellness, about stigma, service delivery and the impact of COVID uh, on, on learning community mental health. Because it isn't just about students. We know that there is interplay and um, uh, interconnectivity between student mental health, faculty and staff mental health. So Nikki, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, first, I wanna welcome you. But I, I, you know, we know that a holistic approach to well-being, one that considers the physical, the emotional, financial, social, spiritual, environmental aspects of wellness, is most effective. Can you just help us, uh, you know, share your mm -hmm. thoughts in the face of this unprecedented disruption that without question is disproportionately impacting members of our communities who identify as black, indigenous and or people of color. How can leaders, decision makers ensure that mental health programming and supports respect our expressed commitments to inclusivity and equity? Hello, everybody, every, all those who are um, joining us today and uh, those who may be joining us later on and watching the live later on. Um, I introduced myself in my language. I said, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Nikki. And uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, wellness is, um, I liked what Denise said in the beginning. Uh, wellness is a journey. It's not a destination. And as an Indigenous person, it's something, a way of life that we practice uh, through an Indigenous um, traditions and culture. And it, it's really embedded in our in our languages and teachings. And um, a lot of that has um, has stopped, especially during this, this pandemic. And um, and what Denise said earlier on, uh, there's been a lot of creative ways of, of incorporating that into into um, Indigenous um incorporating that for indigenous people. And, but the, where I feel like there's um, a lack of support and understanding is that a lot of indigenous people don't have that access to what we're using right now, which is, which is the internet, which is a computer. And so these services, yes, they are continuing on their services, but a lot of um, the people that need them don't have the utilities, the tools, are the means to access these services that are now being alternatively, de alternatively delivered. And so um, that's another, that's something I just wanted to share and express is that a lot of indigenous communities in rural areas, especially, and also indigenous uh, communities that live below the poverty line may not be able to afford to be able to have these access, especially now everything's virtual. virtual. And I think that's a privilege that a lot of us have and don't really, um, uh, we take for granted in aspects like that. So um, just ensuring that we also have services that are just not virtual and continue those on the ground services for um, those people that are affected the most during COVID. So, so Nikki, I so appreciate, um, I, you know, it's, it's easy sometimes to miss pieces of the puzzle, right? So as we think about, uh, the pride that so many of us took in pivoting quickly to facilitate access to services in the face of physical distancing. Your points about uh, other obstacles to, to access um, uh, for really key valued integral members of our community, I think really important. Chris, I'm really curious about your work to curate happiness. And so, uh, you know, can you speak a little bit to this notion of access, uh, a holistic approach, um, uh, thinking about equity and inclusivity with regards to the work that you're leading at, at, at Dawson? Oh, I think you're on mute.
Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I was just saying I'm one voice at uh, Dawson of 1,100, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, privileged to be here today talking to you and uh, agree already with what Nikki has mentioned, what you have mentioned about wellness. Um, and to me, I'd just like to, to quickly say that before we look at COVID, and it, it is a crisis, of course, and I, and I don't want to say that it is not, but I think we might make a mistake of, of saying the isolation, the anxiety, the, the mental health issues that we're having are caused by COVID. They were already in the educational system before. And I think we have to be very honest that what COVID has done is put a magnifying glass on existing problems. So to me, humanizing our schools is really important. Is it a pleasant place to come to visit as a, as a worker, as a student? And it seems rather simple, but it's also profound. And, and where's the stress coming from uh, in, in staff and students? burnout rates are approaching 25-30% in Ontario and Quebec, for example. So what we've looked at uh, is happiness, not in the populist view, but, but happiness as a positive emotion connected to well-being. And can we develop sustainability projects, what we call well-being for all projects, where we look at our, ourselves, can we help others, can we help the planet in such a way that we feel good? And we know research tells us happy people actually start to volunteer more, they contribute more to society. Somehow I feel we get off of that wonderful cycle. So we coined, uh, we're working with Dr. O'Brien, in uh, a Canadian who coined the word sustainable happiness. Can we use sustainability principles as a one method to get back to, to looking at our well-being uh, and creating projects with positive, where we can share positive emotions and develop positive relationships in our school. So to me, it's all about relationships okay well and you know what that really resonates uh, you know many folks i think listening today uh, certainly those uh with a student development background will be thinking even about transition theory about how you take on new things and so the the importance of connectivity and feeling grounded relationships uh feeling resourceful all of those things uh, always with sense of purpose at the center. So I want to come back to your notion of happiness and how that relates to, uh, for example, flourishing, which is very common in a lot of um, our dialogue right now and, and in the standard uh, that Denise spoke to early, earlier. But first, um, Benoit, you know, I, I think there's a segue here that Chris has offered us uh, around the tremendous efforts to reduce the stigma of mental health, right? So um, I, I think to all of our credit, uh, we, we've worked very hard, uh, uh, you know, and I, I, I take such um, inspiration from your leadership uh, to encourage our communities to talk about their own challenges and to seek help. Um, but how do we balance encouraging people to come forward against the reality that many community and campus mental health services are already struggling to meet the demand for service? Do you have some thoughts about that? Uh, Janet, for sure I do. <clears throat> can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Well, uh, let me start by saying thanks for uh, talking about mental health today, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, every time we talk about mental health, we break the stigma on the on this crucial topic. Uh, from from my point of view, uh, stigma is enemy number one. It keeps people silent. Uh, it keeps people suffering, uh, isolated and alone. Uh, it keeps people from getting the support that they need and they deserve. Uh, the, the fundamental question from my point of view is this, uh, do you want people to suffer in silence uh, and not put strain on the system uh, and degrade to a point where they're beyond help? Or do you want people to be able to speak up so that various interventions and strategies uh, can, come, uh, can come into play? Uh, and, and my view is that uh, healing is always possible and that early detection, and that's basic health, early detection is always better than late detection, uh, and, and stigma is enemy number one when it comes to early uh, detection. Uh, so I, I think we need to avoid this false dichotomy that you're either mentally healthy or mentally ill. That's, uh, that's the old world view. Uh, you're fine, until you're not, and the person that are not, uh, there's something shameful about that. We need we need to break this notion. I think we're all on a mental health journey. Uh, some of us are thriving today. Some of us are suffering some stress. Uh, some of us are experiencing the beginning of mental health issues, and and some of us are at a, in a position today where we really need help. And I, I think 
Uh, we need a strategy as institutions to address people across that continuum. And we also need a culture that supports that strategy and that starts with a culture of openness where stigma is not a barrier. So uh, I've been speaking about my own uh, journey out of a sense of responsibility. Uh, I'm lucky that I'm here to talk about my journey. Uh, a lot of people uh, that have had uh, childhood trauma or uh, mental health uh, issues of the kind that I faced or substance use uh, are, are not in a position to be able to lead those discussions. Uh, I, I am and I'm lucky to be and I feel the responsibility to uh, to enter into this virtuous circle where when you break the stigma, other people uh, in turn uh, feel free to tell their story and get the help that they need and deserve. Right. Uh, you know what? So I, I think that there, there's such power in that. Nikki, can you offer kind of insight as a student leader, as an Indigenous advocate, and even in this moment as, as an advocate focused on Indigenous women and girls, you know, can you talk a little bit about the stigma and the provision of services to try and um, help students? You know, sometimes we use the word flourish. Sometimes we use, I, I like the language of happiness, uh, of, of holistic well-being, health. Uh, kind of offer us some thoughts about, from your perspective, about how we can break the stigma and contribute positively to, to moving people along a journey in a positive space. So well, my daughter's right here. She's going to say hi. <laughs> She's, uh, it was her birthday yesterday. Um, so, um, yes, I, I want to, uh, I want, I, I've been taking notes as you guys were talking and um, I like the saying, every time we talk about it, it breaks the stigma. And I think that's where conversations need to continue in, in all areas, on campus, in the institution, in our departments, even at our own table, kitchen tables, talking about, um, Yay, the joys of being a uh, um, uh, working at home with kids and school, guys. <laughs> this is my daughter, <laughs> and this is our cat Mango. <laughs> so, um, Mango, say hi. Okay, Ayana, can you give me a hi. minute? Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yes, talking about it, and mm -hmm. um, and but not just but when you talk mm -hmm. about it, you have to create that safe space so that people feel comfortable talking about it. That they're not, not just. Um, talking into a space where nothing's going to be done about it. And so I, I feel like this is a great area, a great virtual space, virtual circle where we can we can start those conversations and um, on our campus um, to have that uh, approach for our mental health, that interconnectedness Denise was talking about. We have a, an Indigenous uh, space and there's a soup circle every Wednesday and that's where we just go and literally talk. And it could be a, about our classes, it could be about how we're doing that day. It just literally is a space for us to talk. And so now that that's kind of gone, they still practice, they still have that on a virtual, um, on virtual on campus. And we literally have our computers up and you can participate eating your meal or working or listening. So um, yes, thank you for your guys' patience with my daughter. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, sorry, it kind of distracted me just a little bit, but yeah, I definitely feel like the more we talk about it, the more we could break those stigmas. So, so first off, Nikki, absolutely no apologies necessary. I think this is, you know, as as a mom of two teenagers, I think, um, and and leading at an organization that um, is home to learners uh, with a multitude of lived experiences and at various stages um, on on their kind of personal and professional continuum. This is the reality of learning right now. It's the reality of learning. It's the reality of working. And I, I take Chris's point that a lot of these stressors uh, are long-standing, pre-existing, um, but I think everything has been compounded by all of this, right? And um, uh, you know, so so I think you're you're just serving to demonstrate uh, what is lived reality for for many students, for many faculty, for many staff. But but Chris, building on that, uh, as kind of Nikki both speaks to and then uh, lives right in front of us, the reality <laughs> of what physical distancing and, and public health directives and the imperative 
uh, to deliver an increasing amount of content through alternate delivery, largely online, but really all in alternate format. Um, you know, in the context, our, our job as educators, as leaders, is to position learners to flourish, uh, to find you know their po point of happiness, or to educate and support them on their journey uh, uh, to wellness. So, in, in all of this, in the pivot. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about strategies you're employing or you are studying or you've seen that are effective that mitigate the potentially negative consequences of this shift, of this moment in time, um, the negative consequences on mental health? Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. And, and I, I, I'd like to also underline the fact that what just happened with Nikki is exactly what I'm talking about. That was a a micro psychologically restorative moment. We all smiled. I can actually feel my face in a different way. I can relate to a child wanting to share who they are. And then a living organism comes into, this, in, into the screen. I mean, this is being human. It, it, it is exactly what I mean. So this small amount of time that we've sacrificed from a very important panel is really what it's all about. If we can do that in a calculus class and make a connection and just create comfort, What's behind the screen? We talked about that before we came on, but it set a really nice emotional climate uh, before we came on. So, you know, the simplest things are often the most profound. What I've done in my career um, is I've simply developed projects where people have to bump into each other. They have to share who they are. They can be accepted for who they are. They can realize that we need to rescue traditions, that someone in the mountains of Mexico or, or Eastern Canada who maybe has never gone to school or has very limited education, let me rephrase that, has very limited schooling, has a tremendous education. And do we validate that? So I'm still learning um, about psychology and I have a lot to learn, but we need to validate our strengths. It is not the mental stress or illness that we have. It's that it's this amazing flute player that nobody knows about that can translate wonder in the world through music that people will remember for a lifetime. So what we've done at Dawson, and, and again, we're, we're just beginning, is we're looking at how, what makes us happy, but how does, it re, how does that actually affect other people? Can it affect other people negatively, our happiness? And the example I often use uh, in the courses is if we have a coffee, people say, I love my coffee break because I'm away from the stresses of work. I'm with the people I want to be with. This is really powerful. Okay. I'm talking about what I want to talk about, and I'm sharing who I am. And then we'll say, well, where does the coffee come from? Did the person make $2 a day and can't send their, their children to school in another country? Or can we help with fair trade products? So our happiness is maintained during that break, but we can actually think that we're augmenting happiness somewhere else. And by the way, could it be shade coffee? So the birds you hear at your country place have a place to go in our winter, and you'll hear the same sound as you relax, you relax with your friends. Yeah. So this defines what we're trying to do on a larger scale in classrooms and outside the classroom develop projects that say, my God, it feels good to help other people and the planet at the same time. But we need to explicitly develop this into our, into our programming and to our way of life in schools. And examples, I have many, but I don't think we have all that time. But, but do you know what, Chris? So what I really appreciate that, so that's a different lens on the question we started with, right? Which is how do, how do you approach this holistically? And so, you know, I can only imagine um, uh, the power, the impact on students of, of that as a, um, a, a, as a learning context. And I'm, I'm going to come back and ask Benoit to comment, you know, a, 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 as, as a university president, how, how can we support all of our educators, amazing faculty that are operating under, you know, everything we know has been upended and we've pivoted very quickly. But, but how can we support educators in classrooms to promote uh, positive mental health? But I did want to offer just an observation. I, you know, at, at Sheridan, what we've heard from students is that the pivot to the online space was very difficult. But in my coffee chats, and I've been having virtual dinners, and, and um, uh, I have an advisory committee of students that, that provides insight on how we're doing, if you drill down, it's actually not the online learning. It's that they miss being in the coffee line with their peers. Mm -hmm. It's that they miss being on the bus and having the interaction, even the noise of transit getting to campus. Or for some, it's 
I, I was I was in the car and I was listening to music and enjoying just the free space on that front. So, you know, I do think this holistic approach um, it is at the end of the day, the antidote. It, it's trying to frame it. So, Benoit, you know, recognizing that students primary relationship is typically with faculty um, uh, and with staff. Are there things that you've observed that work to cultivate this strong sense of positive mental health in classrooms? How can we support our educators to, to contribute? Uh, I'd like to try to, hand, to answer that uh, holistically, uh, Janet, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. uh, when, when you face a situation like COVID-19 uh, that turns everything upside down within the space of a week, uh, you're, you're faced with this tremendous challenge of how to best support everybody yeah. Uh, and in our case at Carleton, everybody is almost 40,000 people. Uh, support them in continuing their academic mission of, of, of teaching and of learning and of research, uh, but also supporting them in their lives and, and with their mental health. And, uh, and, so, and sometimes that can get, uh, uh, that can get complicated. Uh, I, I really feel for our students uh, and, uh, and for uh, school age children as well. I, I, I think we can argue that for them, for them, not for society or, or, or not for older people, but for them, the cure has really been worse than the disease uh, yep. and, the so, and the social isolation has been terrible. And it's not so much that the courses are on. Uh, with a bit of adaptation and a bit of flexibility, you can get used to that. But it's the fact that your life seems, seems on hold. You don't yep. have your freedom, your liberty, your social contacts, your support networks. Uh, and there's more people than we think or more people than we know that hold their lives together barely. And then something yeah. like COVID hits and it really reveals the fragility in the lives of, uh, of young people and of, and of older people uh, too. So in, in every decision that we've made at Carleton since March, uh, we've prioritized health and safety, including mental health. Uh, we've prioritized the care of our community. Uh, our go-to words have been flexibility. Uh, how can we adapt in real time uh, and deal with the individual circumstances that individual people face? Uh, and compassion uh, and understand the specific challenge that uh, that people uh, are facing. So uh, you speak to the classroom. I'll give you two quick examples. Uh, for our students, we introduced uh, uh, optional pass-fail grading options. Uh, so at their choice, a uh, student that were under pressure of maybe not meeting uh, their own academic standards, uh, whatever they might be, uh, could choose a pass-fail grading option that uh, wouldn't impact their GPA. And uh, a funny consequence of that is, is our retention uh, has increased from one year to the next uh, through the pandemic and, and our students are able to continue their studies, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, for faculty and, and for staff, we, we invested very heavily uh, in uh, our technology and our expertise and support uh, in terms of online learning to make sure that our courses uh, meet the best pedagogical standards. Uh, and to make sure that uh, both our, our faculty online and our students that are taking th those, those classes have a positive uh, experience. So we, we didn't hesitate to invest heavily. The, these are investments that will serve us uh, in, uh, in the future. Uh, we've, al we've also delayed the number of processes around tenure and promotion. Uh, and again, we've been uh, very accommodating of, of particular uh, circumstances, uh, in, in particular the care of, of young children uh, yeah. which has a, a gendered component, uh, uh, unbelievably, in this day and age. Uh, it really does, and, and COVID has, uh, has brought that out. Yeah, and, and so thank you. So you know what? What a great note. I'm going to pass this back to Andrew. I, I just want to thank all of you, um, at, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to quote our, uh, our federal leader, this sucks. Like, this <laughs> sucks. Um, and, and I think to the extent that as good learners do, we can use this as an opportunity to really understand and learn from current circumstance uh, to move us all forward. Um, I applaud all three of you for providing leadership uh, across uh, our sector. Uh, and I'm looking forward to answering some of the questions that have come forward from, from our viewers. So uh, Andrew, back to you. Yeah, well, we've got a bunch of great questions, Janet. That was a great discussion, and uh, and I'm going to turn it over because I want to I want to get the Slido questions in here because we have viewer questions that I want to start. So I'm just going to sort of uh, I'm going to I'm just sort of fade off the screen, and we're going to bring all four of you back on. But first, let's start with the first question here that sort of came in, and and I really like this question. Let me highlight it here so that our viewers can see it. Um, 
Given that PSE institutions are not mental health facilities or experts, what is the right balance for providing services and support on uh, on campus versus off? You know, I, I've got two presidents of one of a college, one of a university here. Let me direct those to you and Janet. Uh, we've had everybody else do all the talking to start. How about we start with you first, and then maybe Benoit, you can add you can add something to this. Yeah, you know what? Thank you. This has been, you know, a, a preoccupation in terms of conversations. I think with, um, you know, both health leaders across, certainly across Ontario, and I think across the country. While it absolutely is the case that we do not deliver, um, uh, you know, uh, we're not a treatment center. It, it is indisputable that that positive health, physical and mental, is foundational to learning. And so I, I think that that line uh, is a very difficult one to try and actually land. Um, you know, our job is to position students for success. And insofar as their mental health is, you know, foundational, fundamental uh, to success, we need to, I think, be accountable for ensuring that they have the right resources. It's also the case that some students don't have the prerequisite level of wellness uh, to succeed. And I think our job, you know, Benoit mentioned the values of, of flexibility. I, I think the others are empathy, compassion, um, uh, and a sense of community so that we embrace folks. And if you're not well enough now, uh, let's redirect, let's engage, let's refer uh, such that students can come back and take advantage of the transformational experience that is post-secondary education um, uh, when they're ready. So I'll leave it to my colleague to expand. Uh, Why do you want to I, I would start by, by re reiterating that we need to walk away from this false dichotomy that either you're well and functioning, uh, in this case, carry on, uh, or uh, you're somehow uh, ill uh, and you need some sort of uh, some sort of acute care uh, from the from the medical profession or, or from some sort of, uh, of, of specialized service. Uh, the question is much more complicated than that. Uh, I think uh, if you embrace wellness uh, as, as a crucial part of the human experience uh, and you accept the notion that, that uh, higher education uh, should, at its very core, uh, be about a rich human experience, then by definition, it's your responsibility as an institution to care about wellness uh, in your strategies and in your culture. So what can you do on campus uh, to ensure that the people who are thriving remain thriving uh, to ensure that the people who are stressed feel supported and have coping strategies to deal with that stress, uh, that people are starting to experience uh, mild uh, mental health uh, concerns, have the right kind of activities, groups, uh, initiatives to support that and bring them back towards thriving. And to your question directly, uh, how can we partner uh, with institutions in the city uh, that are uh, specialized in mental, mental health care to make sure uh, that the two-way interactions functions in such a way that for the uh, proportion of our students, faculty, or staff that, uh, that necessitate uh, interventions uh, in the uh, medium or higher end uh, mental health uh, care, uh, then those services are available uh, in the city. So obviously we have counselors at Carleton. We have almost 30, uh, but uh, we can't just say this student is fine, no counselor. This student is not fine, therefore a counselor. That model is broken and will never work. It, I know we got to get to others, Andrew, but I would just also say that the, the idea that mental health rests with counseling services or with health services more broadly is flawed. It's archaic. It's behind us. So a, a mentally healthy campus rests in policy. It rests in programming. It rests in culture. And I think, you know, that is um, at once... Um, uh, uplifting, but also far more complex. And I think that's the challenge ahead of us. What are our HR policies to keep the community well? You know, how are we responding um, uh, to, to, you know, single moms who are in multi-generational homes worried about transmission and infection and taking, you know, Zoom calls from their bathroom because it's the only private space that they can find? You know, what are we doing in classrooms for students, uh, you know, on the spectrum who can be successful with the right supports 
and the right coaching and mentoring for faculty uh, leading those discussions. So I, I just I just really want to push back against that. Again, this isn't you know it isn't a dualist perspective. It, there isn't one or the other. Uh, it, it 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 needs to be grounded in 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 a in a cultural um, uh, ecosystem approach. Well, and I think you know that sort of segues really nicely into the next question right now. And uh, and are we doing enough for faculty and staff? And 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 I want to I want to direct those questions now to gain a different perspective. One, Chris, from your perspective at Dawson College on the initiative that you're leading, but also Nikki, from you're seeing it from a different perspective as well. And 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 what do you feel that there's enough being done, or what more? I mean, is there ever enough being done? I guess that's not a fair question. But what more could be done that we that, that you can see what are the gaps that we're missing let me turn it over to you guys and if you guys could answer that question for us that would be great uh, so I, I guess I can answer Thanks, that Ricky. question first. <laughs> um, so um, just to clarify you want me to as a student looking at uh, at the at the question as the, my instructor. Exactly. My exactly. And, I think that would be great. And, okay. okay. So, um, I like that um, Janet em emphasized that yes, flex added on to the flexibility concept that we do need empathy and compassion. And I feel like to create a, le a good learning environment, uh, wellness has to be both fair and good for the student for the learner and also for the teacher because it does there it does we do interact with each other whether that be uh virtually or online and um i feel like as a learner there has been empathy and compassion um from both my instructors and, and uh, me giving it to them and them giving it to me and uh and that flexibility has definitely been there and i appreciated that and it's um it's been a, a learning curve and uh, definitely being a student and being a student that prefers to, who excels in the classroom, who excels uh, being able to participate in conversations in human interactions um, has definitely changed my learning style. And so um, I appreciate that the my instructors and professors have definitely shown that compassion and that empathy on my end and, and, and vice versa. That's wonderful. Chris? Yeah, if I, if I could just add to that, what we're finding, and it's human nature, where, where students and staff find hope in activities, they come. Um, so I think, you know, we don't have courses in hope, uh, or maybe we do. And I think one, one actually, uh, Calgary does, it's the University of Calgary, good, good for them. But hope pushes away apathy. And I think where, where there's activities, as Nikki was saying, where you can practice empathy, uh, patience, share, share with others, this is the key. So once again, I mean, a key word I find myself using over and over again is to be explicit with creating interconnections, relationships. We've pushed nature aside, and there's a parallel between how we've pushed nature aside, and yet then we, we, we realize through research that in as little as a few moments, of even what, looking at a poster of a, of a, a sunlit moon, uh, a beach or a butterfly that we calm down. So any activity that reduces stress to me, and I use nature as much as possible with staff and students, and, and there's a whole team of us that look at that explicitly. If we can reduce stress, then we access more memory. We, we are more creative. Research tells us clearly we're more imaginative to solve the complex projects that we have to solve. So that helps me because I can get overwhelmed very easily. As Benoit was saying, we're all on this sort of emotional roller coaster. And when I'm down, somebody can lift my spirits. And especially when we're dealing with life, living plants, that, that wonderful cat we saw in the background. So uh, at Dawson, we continue to bring butterflies and caterpillars into people's workplace. They could take them home and take care of them and, and watch the magic of letting them go. We'll film them and show our friends in Mexico. They're on their way. Three months later, you'll see them. And then the questions come up. What about the hurricanes we're hearing about? Climate action. Maybe that rapper wants to use that poetry and music to teach about climate change. So we challenge somebody. And that person taught more about climate change than I could possibly teach in the classroom with my methods. So just, I think it's a time for us to repurpose education, to look at high impact practices that we know are out there, 
but it's our somewhat fossilized system that doesn't want to change quickly. But if, if we can just revisit what our own research has told us to do and say, how do we massage our policies and our guidelines, our collective agreements are really important. And we, we start looking at the responsibility we all have for positive change rather than get locked into the rights we have within the various agreements that bind us in, in educational institutions. That's one. That's wonderful. Uh, let me move on to the next question here. And thank you so much for both of your perspectives on this. That's what I love about this show. That's what we call it perspectives. Um, let's move on to the next question. What do we do if a student does not want to ha want the help or denies there is a pro uh, there is no problem? So I think if they're if they're denying, if they don't want to acknowledge that there's a problem. What do we do? And and. And now let's get everybody's perspective out on this one, because even as a student, if you have a friend or a colleague who's you're studying with, I'd like to get your perspective too, Nikki. So um, let me start with, uh, how about we start with you, Nikki? We'll go around, we'll go around the horn that way. I'm going to use a baseball term. Baseball is my favorite sport, and I'm very sad that the Yankees <laughs> didn't make it. <laughs> um, uh, that's a great question. and. Um, I think it's maybe it's maybe they don't feel safe and it's not I'm, I just, it's creating that environment where they where they feel safe and and it's the stigma stigma that we're we're talking about in this conversation is the reason maybe they're not wanting to uh, um, admit to or or accept the 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 way they are feeling at the moment and so creating that safe space for those individuals and um and not forcing it upon them and um and saying yeah there is a problem you need help you need to access these services and this is what we're going to do because that's just going to push them away even further uh coming from um if they're especially if they're in that denial phase right now so uh just continuously promoting that safe space promoting the services that you have and i feel like maybe it's not it's not the that they don't want it maybe they're just unaware of it and i feel like this last few months i've learned so much more of the services that are offered on campus and the partnerships that are my campus my my uh university has off campuses i learned so much in this last few months that my university has already, it's already been there, but I just wasn't aware of it. And so I think um, maybe that's a, a what the students feel, that they're, it's not that they're in denial, they don't want the services, they just don't know that they're there and how to access them and how to utilize them. And if that they, if they are eligible to utilize those services. Ben, what can we get your opinion on that? For sure, uh, I, I used to be that person, so I can speak to that. Uh, I think uh, humans uh, are, uh, are programmed to survive mm -hmm. and uh, denial and repression are mechanisms uh, that help some of us survive in, diff in, diff in difficult circumstances. Uh, it's not as if the person who's dealing with trauma uh, chooses unhappiness, depression uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and denial as opposed to a wonderful life. Uh, they choose uh, denial and repression uh, as opposed to death. Uh, so we, we need to consider that very carefully uh, when, when addressing uh, uh, the particular circumstances uh, that people that find themselves uh, under trauma or maybe alienated or facing other kind of personal uh, issues that are very, very deep. Uh, and you can never underestimate the shame that goes with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think Nikki's right on. Uh, you, you need to let people know that you're there uh, that there is a safe space, uh, that healing is always possible, uh, but the timing uh, of the healing, uh, the, the speed of the journey, uh, the only person that can judge that is the person that is on the journey. Chris, Janet, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I, the first word that came up for me when you introduced it was trust. Uh, so these safe spaces, I think we have a responsibility when we look at mental health literacy. I'm a big fan of what I call these theory bursts, where what can we learn quickly about, for example, trust theory, that when there's issues of fairness or protection, a teacher or a staff member, a counselor has to step in, whoever happens to be in that environment. Um, but what does that mean? Because I think good teachers, good leaders, good parents uh, build trust. But when you do, 
people start volunteering information. And again, I think that's healthy, but we have to know what to do with that. And that's where this mental health literacy comes in, uh, in, in institutes of higher education. So to, to address what we think we need to do and then how, how to help very quickly uh, the average person handle that and know when it's beyond them, I think is important. So, so Andrew, I'm watching the time, but yeah. let me just add and, and maybe kind of um, uh, wrap this. So, you know, I don't think the answer is to push people. Um, and I think my colleagues ha have made that point. I, you know, I'm just always mindful. My number one job as a senior leader uh, of, of an academic or learning community is to, is to underscore the transformational power of what we do. So when post-secondary works, it facilitates individual and communal impact that's good for people, for their families, for their communities, for the planet. And I think the more that you can spread that notion of hope and uh, potential, um, you pull people towards this view that wellness is possible, that happiness is possible, that hope is the path forward. And, and it's exhausting and we don't always uh, hit the you know, precise linear path, but I think continuing to underscore that for our communities, for our students in particular, mentoring that, modeling that um, it, it, it is not just our imperative, but it's also the privilege of leading in this space. So. Thank you. Yeah, I think you summed that up really well. And uh, and I just want to take a note to thank uh, thank our guests today, Nikki, Chris, and um, uh, Nikki, Chris, and Benoit for joining us today for all your perspectives on this show. It's been it's been really eye opening. And I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to more questions because uh, I know we could we could actually have forums on this discussion. There are forums on these on these <laughs> issues. And 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 I encourage everybody um, if you're tuning in as a faculty member as a a staff member or even as a student and you're watching CI Can's uh, show today take a look at the resource section that we've put forward and uh, and if anybody or you know somebody who needs help we strongly strongly encourage you to to reach out and try to help and try to be able to get that help because uh, this is definitely a tough time um, so Jenna thank you so much you did a great job co-hosting with me today I hope you'll come thank back you. and do it again I would love that. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And thanks to our guests. Awesome. Great choices and uh, such tremendous leaders. Thank oh, it's been, it's, it's been a wonderful conversation. Now, I'm hoping that with any luck, I can bring uh, Denise and Mio back into the conversation. I, <laughs> I, I'm curious. I Hopefully, she was sort of sitting in the wings watching in there. Uh, Denise, are you there at all? Are, can we get I you? I am. I am. And, and you know what, Andrew? I'm so, so pleased we did this talk today. It is so timely, uh, and I'm grateful to our three great speakers and and, and to Janet to to have uh, host uh, be be a co-host with you. You know, there's a couple of things that uh, stay with me. Uh, the mm. first one is this notions of uh, holistic approach. Mm. Uh, that we have to look at all aspects, basically. Um, I, I, I wrote four things that I, I'll read um, that for me are the takeaways. So mm -hmm. the first one was every time we talk about mental health, we help to dispel the stigma. This, I think it's so, so important. Then this notion of the spectrum that Benoit Antoine talked about, that, you know, some people are at different place on the spectrum and we, we, we need to know about it, we need to acknowledge it, and we need to, to show empathy. The third one was Nikki when she talked about creating a safe space. It's mm. so important, you know, she shared those soup circles that seem to be so cool. You want to go to a soup circles. Mm. And then when Chris talked about repurposing education and, uh, you know, and he has this notions of sustainable happiness. Uh, in our organizations, we've done a pilot, in fact, with the course that uh, Dawson College has developed with, with Chris and his colleague and uh, about sustainable happiness. My staff is so amazed. Now we would like to do it for our entire staff. And so at the end of the day, uh, 
from what I've heard is that mental health is all our responsibility. It's the responsibility of everybody, no matter where we are, no matter where we sit, no matter what's our role. And we owe it to ourselves and to the others around us. And, you know, Absolutely. we've heard words like empathy, flexibility, yeah. hope, trust. So let's continue the dialogue and embrace being human being. Denise, so well said. Thank you so much for those words. You wrapped it up just perfectly. Ladies and gentlemen, that actually concludes our show for uh, Perspectives Live today. I hope you're going to join us again. We're going to carry this conversation on in two weeks uh, in the French version of this with Norman Latour as the, uh, as the host. And we're, it's the same topic, so we're just going to pick it up with new guests and uh, gain some different perspectives with Norman on Perspectives Live. And so until the next time, we look forward to welcoming you back and have yourself a great day. Thank you, everybody.